Many thanks, Esther. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Let me add my welcome to Warwick's. Do keep your Bibles open at yeah, page 32 as we look at this passage together. Uh, let me uh, start with an admission from your pastor as we begin. Uh, many years ago, I used to watch a certain soap on TV. Why? I'm not sure. Uh, but I didn't miss an episode. I watched everyone which soap? Here you go. There we go. What a soap. Now, I won't ask you to put your hand up if there's any fans here this morning. Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, but I, I wonder what comes to mind when you think of EastEnders. I mean, there's probably lots of things. But when, when the Christmas special comes around, when it's promoted for a particular storyline, what seems to be at the heart of this soap and so many others? Isn't it relational mess and pain? Every family has something going on. There couldn't be any more twists in a soap. Nothing is straightforward. Uh, yes, a reflection on society to a degree, but you would never ever want to move to Albert Square, would you? <laughs> Stay away. Well, friends, our passage this morning is full of relational mess. Full of relational mess. Uh, if, if you're with us for the first time, we're going through a series, um, as Warwick has said, looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis in the Bible. It is full of highs and lows, deceit and struggles. Uh, the background is this, uh, and this is in particular in chapter 29. Jacob has just met the woman of his dreams, Rachel, who is the daughter of his uncle Laban. Now, back then, this was a good thing. That, even that scenario sounds a bit strange, but it was a positive match for marriage and your descendants. It was your flesh and blood. Laban has two daughters. Eldest is Leah. Youngest is Rachel. Jacob loves Rachel. And even offers to work for seven years in return for her hand in marriage. Laban, her dad, agrees. The seven years, we're told, feels like just a few days. Such was his love. When the big day arrives, Jacob requests Rachel, um, as promised, I've worked for seven years. Laban throws a wedding celebration for them. Yet on the wedding night, he gives Leah to Jacob and not Rachel and they sleep together. And that, that would kind of cue that ending EastEnders music. Um, that it would stop, you'd just see Leah going into the bedroom. Morning comes, and Jacob is not happy. Laban, why have you deceived me? He replies, Laban says, it's not our custom to give the younger uh, before the elder. Now, note he's only had seven years to mention that small detail. Laban says, finish the bridal week, and then you can have the younger one also. Uh, for another seven years' work. <laughs> you get the picture. Clever Laban, it's all about Jacob's labor and work. Well, after the week, Laban does give Rachel to be Jacob's second wife, and he sleeps with her. Uh, Jacob's love, we're told, for Rachel is, is much greater than his love for Leah, so we have Jacob and we have his two wives. Leah, his first, unloved. Rachel, his second, dearly loved. Now, I, I appreciate it. it is confusing already talking about polygamy and multiple wives. Uh, back then in the ancient Near East, it, it was not uncommon to have multiple wives. Uh, we've bumped into this in, in Genesis already in our series, uh, the likes of Abraham and Esau. Uh, but God is clear in Genesis 2 about his design for marriage. He made us male and female, a man leaves. His father and mother is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Uh, this is God's good design for marriage and it works best like this. 
that the, the multiple wife model seems to have been allowed by God in the Old Testament. It's far from best. It's far from best and always brings hurt and bitterness. So with all that background in mind, we come to our passage. Uh, and it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. There is no hiding from the pain in this passage. Uh, the first verse spells it out. Re- uh, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah is in a marriage where she is not loved. The Lord enables Leah to conceive. He opens her womb and Rachel remains childless. Our very first verse, this is so difficult. We're going to think about these things more, but we're going to run through the passage to begin with. At verse 32, Leah becomes pregnant and she gives birth to a son. In verses 33 to 35, she has three more sons. Then we're told she stops having children. We're not told explicitly why at this point. In chapter 30, verse 1, Rachel sees that she is not bearing Jacob any children, and we're told she becomes jealous of her sister. Just picture the relational complexities already. Uh, Jacob doesn't love Leah, yet she's given him four sons. Jacob loves Rachel, yet she isn't giving him any children. They're living around each other. Rachel, over around three to four years, is watching son after son come from her sister. These boys now running around her, Of course, she is jealous. And Rachel's desire for children is is so clear. Look at what she said at the end of chapter 30, verse 1. She says, give me children or I'll die. She says, Jacob, do something. I don't want to live if I can't have children. Just listen to the desperation Rachel is desperate for a child. Uh, Jacob, a.k.a. Mr. Insensitive, gets angry and says, I'm not God. He's the one who stopped you having children. Well, in chapter 30, verse 3, Rachel takes the matter into her own hands. She goes for the Hagar strategy. Here's my servant, Bilhah. Sleep with her. A form of surrogacy, another woman having your child. Twice, we're told, Bilhah falls pregnant and notice Rachel names the children, signifying that they are hers. So I'm just pausing a moment. Um, Just checking everything's all right. Why don't we stop and pray, actually? I don't think uh, John is feeling too well. We're going to pray for a moment. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we just want to pray uh, for John. Please, uh, Lord, be with him. Thank you for those in the church who are able to help. And we pray that your spirit and your presence uh, would be with them and him. Lord, please um, help us to get the help we need at this time. Please be with Maureen as well, we pray. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's, we'll keep going for a moment. Chapter 30, uh, sorry, where did I get to? Um, There's loads of names in the passage. You probably noticed lots of names as we read it. Lots of names. We're going to come to them. We are not ignoring the names. In chapter 30, verse 9, Leah 
has stopped having children, notices what Rachel is doing, and so reciprocates giving her servant Zilpah to Jacob. Two more sons. We'll have all lost count, but I wonder if anyone has worked out how many sons. So for eight, thank you. Um, Eight, we're eight sons. In chapter 30, verse 14, there is then this very strange mandrake incident. Uh, Reuben has been out in the fields. He comes in with some mandrake plants and he gives them to Leah. Rachel really wants these. Now, the tension between the two sisters is felt, in particular, in chapter 30, verse 15. Leah says, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take away my son's mandrakes too? Now, what are the mandrakes? Don't think Harry Potter, for those who are fans. Instead, it's some kind of love fruit, quite possibly a bit of an aphrodisiac. Now, young people, uh, you might remember mandrakes from the youth weekend away. You studied the Song of Songs, and it's the only other place in the Bible they are mentioned. Chapter 7, verse 13 of Song of Songs, the mandrakes send out their fragrance. And at our door is every delicacy, both new and old, that I have stored up for you, my beloved. We, we get a picture of the fragrance of these mandrakes and what they do. Well, Rachel thinks these, these mandrakes will help her to have children. Uh, she'll do anything to have these mandrakes. Here, uh, Rachel gives Leah permission to sleep with Jacob in return for some mandrakes. And uh, just notice in verse 16, the really, really sad language used. Uh, Leah says to Jacob, you must sleep with me, for I have hired you for some mandrakes. Isn't that sad? She's bought her husband. It appears Leah hasn't been allowed to be with Jacob. Maybe Rachel has stopped this. And so Leah is with Jacob, gives him two more sons, then a daughter. Again, all the time, Rachel living with this. More waiting for Rachel, years. Were those mandrakes any good? Not in the slightest. Finally, in verse 24, Rachel falls pregnant and she gives Jacob a son. How many children now? Eleven sons and one daughter. Who I haven't mentioned Dina yet. Happy days? Far from it. Far from it. Uh, The great sadness of this passage is Rachel is desperate to give Jacob children and Leah is desperate to be loved by Jacob. And they both see the other getting what they want. It is so, so sad. Uh, My my daughter, Chloe, is desperate for a dog. It's, It's her birthday this week. She's asked for a dog. Every Christmas, she asks for a dog. She loves visiting people who have a dog. When out walking with friends once, she wanted to pick up the dog poop. Uh, She has books about dogs, loves um, dog films. She's got ceramic dogs. She's got a huge cuddly dog she sleeps with. In some ways, most of us can relate to something we desperately want, can't we? It's a really petty illustration How much ridiculously worse is it to be in a position like Rachel and Leah? So how how in a passage like this does the passage express some of the feelings that's going on? And it's all in the names. It's all in the names through this passage. Uh, The first four, so come back, back to chapter 29, 32. The first name is Reuben. It means seen. The Lord has seen my misery. Surely, Leah is thinking, my husband will love me now. I've given him a son. Uh, Simeon means heard. The Lord has heard. I'm 
unloved. The ESV, if anyone's using that, says hated. Levi means attached. Will my husband at last become attached to me? Jacob knows what all the names mean. Leah's saying, as your wife, I'm miserable and I feel unloved. Every time the name is called Reuben, Simeon, Levi, will you not love me? With son number four, Leah finally lifts her eyes, Judah, meaning praise. I will praise the Lord. But sadly, it is only temporary. So Rachel then has the two children via Bilhah. Dan means vindicated. Uh, so the Lord has listened to my plea. He's seen my pain of watching all these other boys. Finally, here is mine. But it's almost a ha at Leah. Now it's my turn. Uh, Naphtali means struggled or wrestled. Notice what that means. I have wrestled with my sister and I've won. You can just feel that tension. Every time Dan and Naphtali's names are called, a reminder to Leah of the spite from her sister. So Leah responds uh, through her own servant. Gad, good fortune. What favour is now on me again? Asher means happy. I'm so glad to have yet another. In your face, Rachel. Leah then buys her husband through selling the mandrakes to be near him again. She gets Issachar, blessed. Look at how rewarded I am. Look, Rachel, at all my children. But look at where we are with Leah's last son. Chapter 30, verse 20. Zebulun, meaning honour. Maybe my husband will honour me now. Two or three more years have passed. Leah is still so desperate for Jacob's love. Leah is desperate to be loved. And, and then Rachel finally has Joseph. It's a moment of delight. God has taken away my disgrace. Loads of that tied up with having children in her culture. Would you not think she would be so content, at last, a son? After all these years of waiting, a son of her own. Is she at peace? Does her son fulfill her? Well, what does the name Joseph mean? Uh, look at the footnote. May he add. I want another. The one thing she wanted, she gets, but she's still not satisfied. The very name gives it away. And it's so true. Life will be so much better if. I'll be content if. Yet even when we get that one thing, even if that desire is met, we're so often not satisfied. We're not fulfilled. We just want more. That the names express the emotions in this passage. Leah being unloved. The bitterness and envy between sisters. Rachel desperate for children. Year after year of this, what a deeply sad and unhappy place. And we, the, these emotions begin at a, a really early age, don't they? Uh, the jealousy starts wanting the biscuits that the brother has, or the colour of water bottle or juice bottle that the friend has. And it just gets worse. I remember when I was 13 or 14, I had my first handheld console. Everyone else had the Sega Game Gear or the Nintendo Game Boy. Hands up if you had them. A few of you, yeah, a few of you had them. I got, wait for it, the Atari Lynx. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong, it was still really good, but I had different games. It didn't look as cool. And in my head, what everyone else had was much better. Jealousy, 
envy. We can all relate to that on some level. But underneath the jealousy, don't Leah and Rachel desire something good? Love from your husband, children of your own. These are good. These are biblical. Maybe you're here this morning or listening online and you can relate to Leah. You're in a marriage, whether husband or wife, where you feel unloved, not wanted, badly treated, and it must be awful. You're desperate to be noticed, to hear that kind word, that empathy, some understanding, some spiritual encouragement, yet it's lukewarm at best. The relationship just feels cold. Nothing, nothing in your relationship warrants divorce. No major sin has been committed, but it's just functional. Or maybe you're the one more like Jacob. And you, you know you could be more loving towards your spouse. Maybe you're more like Jacob. And, and we come to church, especially couples, and it, it looks like everything's fine, doesn't it? This incredible veneer appears over the marriages. We hide the struggles, we cover it up, we pretend all is well or okay. The reality is that so many more struggle in marriage than we ever admit, than we, than we ever realise among us. So many marriages are hard work. Or maybe you can relate to Rachel. You desire children of your own and it's so difficult. It's so hard. And it's not happened. Whether it's a medical reason or your own personal health, it's not uncommon to have one or more miscarriages. A partner in the marriage may not want children. You might not be married. There might not be any known reason. That must be really, really hard. But what is the really difficult thing from our passage this morning, at the beginning and the end of the passage, in 29.31 and 30.22, we're told it was God who enabled her to conceive. In chapter 30, verse 2, it says, God has kept you from having children. What do you do with that? Where do you go with that? the one thing you desperately want and God is withholding it or not allowing it. Why would he not bless you with that? And as a side note, I, I don't believe getting medical help is wrong. Not mandrakes though. We, we reach out for medical support all the time for our bodies. It's a blessing from God. But whatever the outcome, it's down to God. Either way, there is lots of pain. So now I, I notice a news article every two to three months that reminds me of personal significant loss. I take a moment and then I move on. But I cannot imagine what it's like walking into church every week and seeing the one thing you want running around the church. We, we don't understand why some things happen. For years, I questioned why God would take my dad when I was only seven. When we lived in Sidmouth, there was this tragic road accident when a youth from another church was killed on a bike. You might be here with questions such as, why haven't I met my life partner? Why couldn't we have children? Why didn't you heal my loved one? 
Uh, and for many of us, there are moments where we might doubt who God is, his ability, or even his love. But I, I have learned that without God, life is just bleak. It is just empty. There is nothing and there is no one to turn to. And whilst we might not understand, have no doubt that God does love you and he loves me. He loves us. He's proved that by sending his son to die for us. His love and compare and compassion is far greater than we can ever imagine and his ways beyond our understanding. And so what do we do? What do we do with all this, with these things going on in church family? I want to suggest three things to help, not not in any particular order. Firstly, if something has been said this morning that has been difficult or hard, please reach out and talk to someone Ask for prayer, find someone you trust and respect. Don't let what God is speaking into this morning remain hidden. The bitterness, the envy, the hurting feelings towards God and others will just increase. I'd love to speak to you, the pastoral care team would. We could recommend counselling. We would love to run a marriage course soon. God has given us each other. Let's be a church who rejoices with those who rejoice and weeps with those who weep. I wonder, when did you last cry with your brother and sister in Christ in their pain? When did you last weep with someone else? The Bible, secondly, lament. The Bible helps us to respond to these hurts, especially the Psalms. It gives us permission to come to God in the midst of our pain and questions and cry, why, Lord? Why have you not given me a child? Why am I surrounded by children and yet don't have one? How long, Lord, must I wait? How long, Lord, must this pain continue? It gives us permission to to ask the question, why did you give me this husband or wife, Lord? Why don't I feel loved by them? Why is my marriage so hard? How long, Lord, must this carry on? Lamenting before God when we don't understand things is part of our turning to him. It's a prayer directed to God. And part of that turning is saying to God, yet I choose to trust you. I will trust in your steadfast and unfailing love for me and I will trust in your sovereign ways. I will sing your praises. Reach out to others, lament to God. And thirdly, reorientate your desires towards Jesus. While both the desire for children and to be loved are such good desires, what is the impact of these desires? What was the impact on the sisters that we looked at? Envy, bitterness, jealousy, selfish gain, putting yourself first, even more hurt and pain. When you desire these things above everything else, when you long for this so much, it can so easily cause you to behave in ways that aren't healthy. These things become idols in our hearts. Where should we place these desires? Who should we desire more than anything? Isn't it Jesus? Isn't it our Lord and Saviour? Imagine if all the affections you felt for these other things were placed on someone who loves you unconditionally, who is there for you always, who always wants your best and who can fulfill every longing of your heart. Set your desires on Jesus. Come to the bread of life, come to the living water and let him satisfy every longing of your heart. 
As we close, you might be thinking, does any good come out of this passage? But there is much hope. There is hope here. Uh, In two of Leah's sons in particular, Levi, through whom comes Moses and the priestly line, Judah comes the Messiah. Yes, the unloved Leah's blood flows through our Saviour. The Lord hears Rachel's prayer. He remembers, he listens. In this instance, he blesses her with a son. Her shame is gone. And Joseph, her son, will one day rescue his family and an entire nation when famine strikes. And how encouraging for the original reader, the Israelites, to read this passage and hear the mess of their origins. Yet they belong to a God who remains faithful to his promises and is leading them into the promised land. This is where they came from. Yet God is faithful. In the mess, God's plans don't suddenly cease. Through all we're going through, God is at work. No, God can handle the mess. In fact, he works best in the mess. He left the glory of heaven. He stepped into a world of mess and brokenness. God doesn't shy away from mess in the slightest. He was right in the mess. He physically came and lived among us. He knows and understands what this is like for us. But he then goes further. He takes on all the mess himself, all the pain and brokenness. He dies for all our sin and he promises a better day is coming. A better day is coming when he will wipe away every single tear that we are shedding and we are feeling at the moment. One day he promises all will be well. And now, Now, while we're still living in the mess, he hasn't left. He hasn't abandoned us, but he's right here with us. His spirit with us every minute of every day. Keep trusting in him. Remember your hope in him, whatever your mess might be today. And know that he is with you always and he loves you deeply. We're going to stop there. We're going to pause. I've said loads this morning. It's a really tough passage. And let's just be quiet for a moment. It's going to, there's going to be lots that's been very difficult. I'm going to instruct you how to pray further in a minute, but, but let's just be quiet. I want you to think of someone you know and pray for them where life is hard. Maybe the Lord has put someone on your heart in particular this morning. I want you to spiritually put your arm around them and in the quiet, pray for them. Lord, there is nothing that is hidden from you. And you know how your word has landed today. And we pray that your spirit would minister your grace and your truth and your comfort to all those that are hurting and have questions and are in pain among us this morning. Lord, our hearts cry out for them to you, the living God. Please, Lord, work in this place by your spirit. In your name, Jesus. Amen.